Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Joseph Mishuki, I don't know whether you're in a position to address us now. The next two minutes, kindly. Honor Joseph Mishuki, we are giving you two minutes to, to make your introductory remarks. Okay, okay, no problem. He seems to have a problem, but we'll know going forward. I don't know what I... I am the only one experiencing that problem, but I am not in a position to hear what Joseph Mishuki has said. But no problem, we just continue. So allow me to switch off my camera to ensure the strength of my network. But I'm right here engaging with you. Thank you very much. So before we kickstart the debate, I want to give you some quick facts or the background of the times we are living in. I'll start with this. Currently, the world global economy is contracting. As you all know, occasioned by the outbreak and the rapid spread of COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic and the ensuing containment measures have devastated global economies, disrupting businesses and livelihoods. Global economy contracted by 3.5% in 2020 from a growth of 2.8% in 2019. So there was that contra contraction by 3.5%. In Kenya, our economy contracted by 5.5% in the second quarter, quarter of 2020, from a growth of 5.2% in the first quarter. But the government has been saying that there are signs of recovery that were experienced in the third quarter after reopening. The government has continued and has given stable projection moving forward. It has given some projection on the macro stability, the nature of exchange rates moving forward. So even before we delve into the budget, I want to ask this question to my panelists. When we were coming up with the budget, what do you think are the priorities that should have guided this process? What do you think should have been the priorities guiding this process? Starting with you, Mr. Brian, what do you think should have been the priorities guiding this budget-making process? Kindly. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Nationalist. Uh, the main aim of this budget 2021-2022 uh, is to focus on the economic recovery against the background of COVID-19 pandemic. So the aim of the budget, or something that um, was the main area of focus of the budget was COVID-19 pandemic and the recovery of our economy. Areas that the government should have focused uh, majorly in this budget are one, the MSMEs, the micro, small, and medium enterprises, and number two, most uh, the, 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 the uh, businesses that are affected by the lockdown, especially the hospital hospitality industry and uh, businesses that engage in the night economy. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Brian. Mr. Solomon Kihanga, what do you think should have been the priorities in this budget-making process? Um, thank you, thank you, Nationalist. Uh, and I would want to echo my sentiments as expressed by Brian on what should have been prioritized on from a budget perspective. Just to put things into context, um, we are in interesting situations. 
COVID-19 really threw a spanner into the works. Uh, whatever projections the government had took a quick uh, reverse. And what that means is that um, as a government, uh, we are put in a and I want to call it a dilemma for a number of reasons. Number one, as the government, I need to prioritize the recovery of the economy so that I'm able to put money in people's pockets and therefore stimulate economic growth. However, at the same time, uh, we are in a situation where we have upcoming elections in 2022 and therefore from an executive perspective, uh, the government is trying to pick uh, within this one and a half year, so let's just say one year, what can I show Kenyans in terms of my legacy project? And the theme that has been there for the past uh, four and a half years has to do with the big four. The third one, and I think uh, a very dicey topic of discussion has to do with debt. Some of the infrastructure projects which we've uh, undertaken, an SGR comes in, into mind. It's a highly leveraged uh, project. And those concessions that were attached to project, like um, the repayment period grace, uh, the grace period have come into expiry. And therefore, we're in a situation where these obligations have become due and need to be paid. And therefore, the question becomes, where do we get this money? The talk that is around um, media, and I know social media is that uh, it is expected that uh, at least one trillion is allocated to debt uh, repayment, which is quite a significant amount. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. I can see you are almost in a similar line of thought with, with Mr. Brian. Let us hear what Mr. Mishuki has to say. Mr. Mishuki. Bwana Joseph, you may address us. Okay, okay, no problem. Since Mr. Mishuki is still experiencing some trouble on his side, but I believe he'll be able to sort that in the next few minutes. So, gentlemen, you've given me your perspective on what should have guided this process. Now let us go to the real budget. Fast forward, the 2021-2022 budget is premised on this theme, Building Back Better, a Strategy for Resilient Economic Recovery. Let me repeat that again. The budget was premised on the theme of Building Back Better, a strategy for resilient economic recovery. And I want to start by asking you, from the allocations in the budget, did you see the potential of the budget to bring forth the resiliency in economic recovery? Mr. Solomon, do you think it has the potential of building the, bringing forth the resiliency in economic recovery and building back better? Mm, thank you, Nationalist, for that question. Um, given the situation we are in right now, um, the priority will have to go towards the health sector. In a situation where um, uh, the COVID rate is rising in certain sectors of the certain sections of the country, and therefore, for the economy to be fully opened up, priority needs to be given towards such things as um, the vaccination against COVID which according to the government uh, located around 14 billion. Initially, when rolling out the COVID vaccination program, uh, the aim was to vaccinate by 30% of the population by 2023. However, in my view, that would not be enough in getting the economy to where it is supposed to be. And therefore, when I look at the budget, um, could more be done to help us build back better I think so. The answer to that would be yes. In as much as um, there's been an allocation of around 121 billion to, towards healthcare, 
I think more can be done in order to fast track the opening up of the economy. Uh, and that's the perspective I would want to take with respect to my views as to whether the budget envisaged would help in bringing the economy to where it was prior years. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your uh, informative thoughts. Mr. Brian, what is your opinion on that? Uh, about building back better and stronger for a resilient economy. Uh, a point, a serious point to note is that this budget is an incremental budget, an increase of 24% of the previous budget. But remember that the economy has gone down, has recessed, has contracted as the way a nationalist to put it, because of the pandemic. So in this budget, I expected it to be a reduction or an equivalent of the previous budget because the economy has contracted. And going forward, because the COVID-19 is here to stay, it means that the growth projection that the Ministry of Treasury is having on the economy might prove to be an up, 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 an up, uh, uphill task. So uh, this budget, uh, building back, uh, building back stronger, I don't think we are going to build uh, our economy back stronger because the main priority of the government should have been the COVID-19 pandemic because a healthy nation is a healthy economy. And if we want to revive our economy, then it means that the citizens of this country should be healthy, should um, be vaccinated from COVID-19. And as stated by my co-panelist Kihanga, 121 billion of the budget has been allocated towards universal health coverage. Out of the 121.1 billion allocated to universal health, a paltry 14.3 billion has been allocated towards mitigating COVID-19. Now, remember that the government needs to vaccinate the whole population to prevent the population from the vagaries of this virus. The amount is so meager that it cannot even uh, purchase vaccines to vaccinate a half of the population by 2022 or 2023. So uh, more funds should have been channeled towards COVID-19. More funds should have been channeled towards purchase of vaccines, towards research of this virus, intense research of this virus, its mutants, and its variants. And possibly, funds should have been allocated towards the possible invention of the cure of the virus. We cannot depend virtually on everything on the West or on other countries. We can also make our own. So the budget failed in addressing the COVID-19 situation. And hence, I don't think we are going to build, uh, build back stronger with a sick nation. Okay, okay, okay. Those are very, very interesting thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to agree that my panelists are very passionate about health. And moving forward, we need to address the health yeah, more. <clears throat> and as we go on, I want to welcome and appreciate all of you who has, have attended this meeting. I also want to tell you that you can continue channeling your questions through the chat box on your Google Meet platform. You can throw in your question there, which we will give to the panelists. And also this conversation is ongoing online. You can get us through our Twitter handles at Econscholar UON. 
someone is handling that to handle as we continue with the debate and updating what we, we deliberate on. You can also follow me at Nationalist Mbogwa and tag me if you have a question and we'll address them here. So I can see the questions are flowing and I'll direct them to my panelists in due time. And we, we, we've talked about the potential of bringing forth the resiliency. I want to give you some few facts on what the president calls the Big Four agenda, or the Jubilee government has called as the Jubilee agenda. And these are their locations towards that end. Food and security has been given 60 billion. The universal healthcare, 47.7 billion. Manufacturing, 20.5 billion. Affordable housing, 14.9 billion. So this is my question to you gentlemen. Do you believe these allocations will ensure the cementing of Uhuru's legacy as he winds up his final year as president? And also, to be answered with that question, is that the president has been saying that these infrastructure projects are like enablers. They are enablers to catapult the economy. Uh, do you agree on that line of thought? Uh, the infrastructure projects are enabling the, con the, the economy to take off. And do you believe they will also create a legacy for him? Mr. Busene, you may go first. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. There is a, a legacy project, the Big Four Agenda of December 2017 by His Excellency the President, Uru Kenyatta, and uh, his Jubilee government. Uh, let me speak to, uh, first I'll begin with affordable housing. You've started that affordable housing has been allocated 13.9 billion. And I remember in 2017, the Jubilee government told us that in years, they would have constructed 500,000 housing units in urban areas. This translates to 100,000 in a year. Uh, simply let's go to the statistics of the United Nations. UN states that Kenya has a housing deficit of 2 million. And additionally, a deficit of 250,000 every year as per UN habitat. Now, uh, the 13.9 billion allocation on affordable housing to me is a misallocation by the government. The government doesn't have any business in building houses. And uh, the government, the aim of the government was to improve the living conditions in the, in, uh, the slum areas, the informal sectors, uh, the informal settlements, sorry. Now, the problem of uh, mushrooming of informal, sector, uh, informal settlement is not the informal settlement in itself. The problem is low income and unemployment or underemployment. Most Kenyans leave the rural areas to go to urban uh, settlements to uh, seek uh, better living standards, uh, to get employed, to look for jobs. But once they get there, they're faced with unemployment and or and employment. This leaves them earning low wages and hence they resort to living in the informal settlements. The government should have focused mostly on the job creation and ensuring that uh, its citizens, especially those in the slum areas and those migrating from the rural to urban, have 
better wages. So the government should have dealt with the issue of income, low income, and unemployment. So the 13.9 billion by um, the, the, the CS for Treasury should have gone to improve the living standards in those informal uh, settlements, such as better electricity or electricity access access to uh, water, sanita uh, sanitation, and sewerage in those informal settlements. Number two, we have uh, under that uh, manufacturing. And under manufacturing, he says manufacturing for job creation. But now, the, the main aim of government, government should create, okay, government is not very, very efficient in creating jobs. And, and, and that is a fact. Government is not efficient. That is a business or an affair of the private sector. The private sector is very, very, very efficient in job creation. So what the government should have done is, uh, one, provide a conducive environment. The tax levied or, or, or uh, provide tax subsidies to, to, to businesses, to startups. That should have been the aim of the, of the government so that the businesses can enlarge, they can grow. And once the businesses grow, then it means that they can employ many people. They can employ more youths. Uh, on the issue of infrastructure, uh, roads, yes, we understand that the president and the Jubilee government is building or coming up with infrastructure. But my main concern is that the infrastructure that the president or the, the, the government is trying to come up with is concentrated within specific regions. Now, you want the economy of the whole country to grow. You don't saturate development in specific regions. We have the expressway in Nairobi. Why don't we have those roads in Western? Why don't we have those roads in Kericho where they grow tea? Why don't we have those roads in Narok where tourists flock in Narok uh, uh, to, 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 to watch the wild beasts in Narok? So the president missed a certain point uh, in uh, the manner in which infrastructure, uh, okay, he came up with, he, 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 cons a, a, yeah, he constructed roads or he developed or he brought infrastructure in the country. And another thing to add is that the cost of this infrastructure is very high. And for the government to finance most of its infrastructural projects, it has had to borrow externally. And that means that the debt is ballooning in the country. Okay, Take okay, okay, okay. Thank you. At the Miss, 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 Mr. Brian, we will get to that okay, shortly. Thank you. I end there. Can... <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We may give our panelists also a chance to to contribute. So, our third panelist who experienced some trouble joining us and was not able to to continue with the meeting. So I want to, I can see the meeting, there are plenty of economists. I want to give a chance to one of us, one or two, I can see several. I will be mentioning them or calling them upon to fill in the gap, to hear the economist view. So I'll give this question to Mr. Kefa Simiu. Yes, he's an economist. Mr. Mr. Kefa. In our economics classes, we learned that infrastructure forms the bedrock of the economy. And as we have seen, the government has allocated massive funds to infrastructure, totaling to 310 billion. So my question is, do you think or do you agree with the government that by 
allocating this much funds, they are creating or enabling the economy to take off. Mr. Kepa Semil, please. Okay, it seems our economists are experiencing real troubles today. Then I'll call upon Esther Ngendo. Can you stand in for Kefa and tell us what are your thoughts? Okay, hello, nationalist. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, so you've asked whether the allocation for infrastructure will spur development, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So let me first start by mentioning that uh, before the formulation of any budget, some things are always put into consideration. And you can say that uh, any country's budget is mainly composed of, uh, you know, the consolidated, uh, consoli consolidated, consolidated funded services and also budget, the budget for ministries, departments, and government agencies which are commonly known as MDAs. And the consolidated funded fund services mainly consists of payments that cannot be negotiated. These are payments that have to be made. And one example is debt repayment. So when you come to our infrastructure, we have to question ourselves what, uh, what funds are being used to drive infrastructure in our country. And we can see that our debt levels are continuing to rise. And uh, for our budget for the year 2021-2022, 271.2 billion, which is approximately 4.4% of GDP, is what is, uh, is what is expected to be raised in form of, you know, external financing in form of debt. So I would say that infrastructure in itself is not a bad way of spending our money because we know that uh, infra infrastructure is one example of social overhead capital. And when citizens, both private sector and even the government itself takes advantage of social overhead capital, it's going to drive development in the economy. But, our problem in our, but the problem in our country is that we are financing infrastructure using debt money. And I would not say that that is an efficient move. So I, I would rather we, you know, start developing by using the little finances that we have, even if it's at the cost of infrastructure, because this is going to cost us at some point in the future. That is my view. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Brian Kibet, representing economists, what is your opinion? And I also want to throw in a quick fact on that. Mr. There is this guy, a certain, a certain, a certain professional was in, on Citizen TV a few days ago. And he said that, he said that there are nine trillion worth of stalled projects in Kenya that are yet to be completed. And he considers that that is Kwame Oweno, Institute of Economic Affairs, CEO. And he said, he estimates that almost 70% of that is going to be white elephant projects. They'll never be completed by this government or any other government. So, Brand Kibet, as you contribute to that, please contribute to that. give a thought on that fact. Give a thought on that fact. Okay, nationalists, I hope you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Okay, proceed. Um, the basic understanding of, of okay, let me first uh, try to address what Esther talked about. Um, the challenge being that you have uh, financing for structure through this uh, going beyond our budget limit. Um, no country is able to actually raise revenue enough to finance its budget unless if it only wants to stay at the sustainable um at the basic subsistence level whereby we are only paying salaries and um i think just running the government of the day yeah 
Um, infrastructure is a very expensive thing, and anything that calls for capital expenditure actually must be financed through debt or some physical, some sort of physical deficits. Um, if we had a strong currency, let's say our currency was exchanging at something like 80 or 70, then synergy and deficit financing could have worked for us. But now that our currency is already weakening, I think we ran short of options. But now the issue is about the white elephant projects, the projects that we are having um, as being problematic, yeah? Some like the Kimwarer, Aror, um, those projects that were just started by the government and we have spending of around 10, 20 billions that have already been put in place for the foundation levels. Yeah, these projects have already cost the government some reasonable quantities of money, quantities that cannot be recovered because they are sunk at the end of the day. And in the entire process of procurement, in the entire process of tendering and the initial stages of a project, project evaluation and such like activities. So when this project stalled, now that's where the problem comes in. Um, as a government, the government should be, uh, not entirely as a government, but any institution, be it government, private sector, that wants to engage in capital expenditure. We usually say that the initial stages of capital expenditure is to build an enabling environment. We all know that infrastructure is actually an enabling environment, and it all ends there. So when the government spends 10 years, that's the entire period of a government to do infrastructure and such enabling environment. That's where the problem comes in. Um, because... You don't finish those projects by the time you get out of office. And infrastructure does not count anything on economic growth. Yes, it counts on development, but you know, develop, but without growth, development is not something that is substantive or can be just, we actually, development is a distributive issue, not a productive issue. I think we all understand that. So the moment we fail on the productive aspects of the economy, so that the economy is not growing because we focus more on infrastructure, and not on the actual capital expenditures that are going to raise the revenue enough to, to fund and finance these expenditures, for instance, um, the standard gauge railway, okay, that one was completed, but it's a rail to nowhere because it ended nowhere, somewhere midland. Um, somewhere, some like those for the Lamu port, the Lapset project, and such like ports that were not completed. Such projects are not going to pay for their own cost. So they cease being capital projects and they become national assets that only count in GDP. And, we, and as we all know, GDP is practically nothing when you go to analysis of welfare and development in the country. I think that's my position. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Those are very, very interesting thoughts. <laughs> so, Mr. Solomon, I had saved you for this section on taxes. Whenever the budget is mentioned, when you tell, if I tell my mother in the village that the budget is being read today, first thing she'll ask is what is being taxed that was not taxed earlier. That is the first thing. So I want you to make us understand the finance bill. And I'll start by asking you a very simple question. For starters, is taxation a bad thing? Because everyone seems to hate taxation and paying taxes. Is taxation a bad thing, Mr. Solomon? Okay, thank you, Nationalist, for that question. Um, taxation can be a good or a bad thing, uh, depending on what you want to achieve at the end of the day. If you want to achieve uh, economic growth in one sector of the economy, then you can say the taxation goods that you are given is a good thing. But if the sole aim is to increase revenue, it can have both a positive effect or a negative effect, depending on who you are looking at. So it really depends on what you look at. So, for example, uh, if I can take you through the finance bill, one of the things that has been done is they've introduced 15% of valorem excise duty on the importation of uh, motor vehicles. And if, you, and if you ask yourself the reason for this is, in my view, uh, that proposal is aimed at discouraging importation of those uh, motor vehicles and encourage local assembly of the city. So from that perspective, uh, taxation would have a positive effect on those people who engaged in the business of local manufacture of um, uh, motorcycles. On the other hand, if we, one of the things that was proposed in the budget but not mentioned in the budget speech by uh, Honorable Nuku Yotani is the proposed introduction of VAT on bread. You know, the, the immediate impact of that is it increases the cost of um, bread by that 16%. 
and that would possibly put the welfare of most people uh, in a worse off situation because was let's say be able to buy a, a loaf of bread with let's say 30 slices for me to maintain that price maybe i'll have to reduce the slices to 30. And that has other ripple implications so in conclusion i would say it really depends on what angle you look at um but at the end of the day we need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the government needs to finance its activities one way or the other either through debt um taxation or appropriation ceiling. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. It seems I will stop using a certain quote I saw somewhere that someone had shared with me that said that he was born free but he is being taxed to live and he made me have a very bad impression on taxes. So moving forward, on the Finance Bill 2021, which was introduced for first reading 5th May 2021 in Parliament, the bill, I believe some of you have, have seen it, proposes registrations amending 11 previous acts of parliament, which includes the Income Tax Act, VAT, Excise Jury, Capital Markets Act, Kenya Revenue Act, and the Insurance Act, among many others. So without delving deeply into the finance bill, Mr. Solomon, I would like you to tell us, do these proposals Print a picture of a government on route to ensuring resilient economic recovery and building back better, which is part of the theme. These proposals contained in this finance bill. Okay, thank you, nationalist. Um, an interesting thing to note with regards to the finance bill is um, really there isn't what I would say many increases or decreases in uh, tax rates. The focus would be more around using existing measures uh, just to try and mobilize as much revenue as possible. So we could look at this in a number of ways. From an income tax perspective, um, the only rates that have been amended have to do with uh, withholding tax on petroleum companies. And basically, there have been increases from maybe 10% to 12.5%. But the major focus is uh, on sharing of information. And we need to appreciate the fact that uh, we are living in a very interconnected world where companies from out there come and set up subsidiaries in Kenya and the vice versa is true. And therefore, uh, this conversation going on around shifting of profits such that, um, for example, if, the, if I want to reduce my tax bill in Kenya, I would want to shift excess profits to a low tax jurisdiction. And therefore, from a government perspective, um, what they would want to do is, um, what is your interaction between myself in Kenya and those companies out there? Can I get that information from a KRA perspective? And once I have that information, then I would have a better basis for investigating further your operations and possibly bringing more money into tax. The other thing is, um, the truth of the matter is over the last two years is uh, the number of exceptions that were previously available are significantly being reduced. And this is uh, with the aim of bringing more income to tax. And I would expect this to go into the future. Uh, just trying to link the theme of the budget to the tax measures. And I know one of the pain points is Without employment, uh, I wouldn't have income to purchase my day-to-day -day stuff or I wouldn't have money circulating enough in the economy. And one of the proposals they made is the introduction of uh, rebates to companies that hire at least 10 people from both the university and technical uh, TVETs, put it as that. And therefore, what that is aimed at is encouraging people to employ and if I employ, uh, then over and above the salary cost I incur on you, I give you an extra pass, uh, amount that I can deduct against my profit and therefore lower the tax bill. I could go on and on. Uh, and maybe I'll just want to put a pause to that. Then if we go along, then we can discuss more on the taxes. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to, to jump to my 
university students and tertiary students who are here and give them some quick facts from the budget. So <clears throat> the, the finance bill introduced rebates to internet data providers, which may reduce the cost of internet. There is expansion of tax rebates for apprenticeships or companies who employ at least 10 university or technical and vocational education training students, as Mr. Solomon has shared, those companies will be eligible for tax rebates. Previously, an employer would qualify for this rebate if they hired at least 10 university students only. Now the bracket has been increased to, to also focus also on the tertiary and college students. So I wanted I want to ask Mr. Brian Busenei through these proposals. Is the government showing focus on, on young people? Is the persona of Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, the president, standing up to his title as a global youth champion? Mr. Brian, what do you think? Uh, I didn't get your question. Is it Brian? There are two brands. <laughs> Kibet oh, and Busini. I was, this, this was to you because you are the Hello? student here. I didn't clearly this, get this was, uh, I didn't, okay, okay. you're breaking off. Yes? Oh, sorry, sorry. I was saying I have shared some facts on what I think touches on young people and students from the finance bill, what mostly touches on young people. And I phrased this question, do you think these proposals, the government is showing some focus to young people? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, to, to, to an extent, the rebates uh, given to institutions, um, to companies that take in activist students as per the finance, uh, Financial uh, Act 2021, uh, that is a good, it's a good idea. It will ensure that most of the students get prior training before they uh, join the, 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 the uh, job market. So yes, it's a good thing. And uh, the government should continue, should encourage it. In fact, the government should encourage that because now we get experience. And uh, once you get experience, it is easier for those TVET graduates to get jobs going forward. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Estang Endo, do you share the same optim optimism with Mr. Brian, considering also some quick facts that the help allocations have been slashed by one billion? I believe you've seen the screenshots going around today that help is sending to, to students, where they are saying that you've received your your allocation, you are allocated some money, but you may not be able to get during this year because they didn't get the money from the government. So Esther, do you share with the optimism that the government is showing, showing focus on young people with that fact in mind? Okay, please allow me to treat the two separately. When it comes to hiring firms being given rebates on hiring, students or people who have just graduated from higher institutions of higher learning, I would say it's a laudable move because it gives the students a chance to acquire the skills that are needed in the job market and also some sort of experience which will come in handy when they're seeking for employment in the near future. Now when it comes to slashing of help allocations, I would say it's one of the consequences of the actions that have previously of the financial decisions that have been there previously. Because, you know, one thing is, we have to agree that the, 
there's a problem with the accountability system in our country when it comes to management of public funds. And I would say that uh, most of the public funds are lost through corruption. And we actually don't see instances of the money being given back to the state or even to the treasury itself. So I would say it's one consequence because if we had proper management of public funds, we wouldn't have to suffer dire consequences such as the slashing of the health finance uh, of the health finances, and that actually questions the, whether whether the government really has students in mind, because we agree that uh, you know the life at campus is a critical stage in most or nearly all of us, and once there is inadequate finances to you know further one's education at that level, it becomes a question of do we really have these people's interests at heart? So I would say it's some sort of, you know, a double-edged sword. On one hand, the government is voting for young people, while on the other hand, it is letting down the young people that it actually says it promotes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Maybe you can wind up by telling us what do you think of the, the mention by the CS that they might revise the university school fee? the cost sharing plan that was implemented in from 1991 so they meant revise the fees upwards what are your thoughts on that esther okay thank you nationalist i would say that the effect of uh, raising student fees is going to negatively impact education in our country this is because we already have students who are already struggling to meet the already set fees and an increase in that, and an increase in fees will increase the pinch, both to individuals and even reduce the number of students who are going to be able to afford education in higher learning institutions. That is what I would say. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Let us go to another matter. I see Mr. Jonia is raising his hand. I'll give you a minute in a few to say what you wanted to say. But before that, let us go into matters corruption. This is a matter that all of you, I believe, have interest in and passion in. So the president the other day, while speaking in radio, he said that we are losing two billion daily to corruption. Other estimates say that we lose at least a third of our total budget to corruption given the, by the budget estimate of this year, that means the figure is around 1.3, around 1.2 trillion to corruption. The former Auditor General, Mr. Edward Oko, speaking at a certain event, spoke of a phenomenon he referred to as budgeted corruption, through which the budget is inflated by monies that are earmarked to be stolen. Mr. Oko characterized the budgeting process as a highway and such projects as exit lanes. Mr. Solomon, are you in agreement that our budget making process could have been hijacked by cartels? That's an interesting question. Um, since this is something I cannot verify, I only say that uh, I can't really comment on whether the process has been hijacked uh, by cartels. But uh, what I do agree with you with on is that um, indeed corruption is a scourge that is affecting our country. And maybe if this is something that could be addressed, then it will better assist in better utilizing the public funds that we have. Okay, okay. Since since you since we were tried to dive that question, I'd like you to tell us whether from the budget policy statement, whether it spoke on anything on how the government is going to cut down waste and corruption. Did you hear anything to do with that? Yes. Um. If you look at the both the budget policy statement and the the budget speech yeah. there is mention uh, by the government on focusing on reducing non-priority expenditure 
And I think um, as part of the 2.434 billion that IMF uh, uh, provided to Kenya uh, as part of the economic recovery package, there are some conditions uh, attached to which, uh, which the government is required to comply with. So one of the measures used in um, ensuring that um, wastage to some extent is reduced is by digitizing the procurement system. And I think this is one of the areas where a big loophole for corruption exists. So everything but as government procurement has to be done digitally. We'll wait to see whether that will uh, help address uh, some of the leakages we have both from a uh, corruption and uh, wastage perspective. Yes, so those will be my comments for now. And also in the budget statement, I also noted that uh, some 3.2 billion was allocated to the corruption, anti-corruption fighting agencies. Is that enough? I really can't comment that for, uh, on that for now, but my personal opinion is uh, we just have to wait and see how this goes. Okay, okay, Mr. Brown Busene, what do you think can be done to ensure that the allocated funds actually serve Kenyans, not some few people in government? Uh, about the funds serving Kenyans, uh, we, we can leave that to the agencies that fight corruption and uh, a goodwill from the executive. I li like to touch on. on on the issue of corruption. Uh, it is estimated that close to one trillion of our budget is lost uh, to corruption, to graft. And most of this graft by state officers, political leaders, is uh, in the tendering processes. Um, Government comes up with projects. Government, uh, then the state, the corrupt state officers use that as a leeway to steal funds. They inflate the tenders so that they can get something from it. So mostly the issue here is tendering process, that, that is the main concern. And that I think is um, the place that the anti-corruption agencies should keenly look into and expedite so that they can ensure that graft is lowered. Look at Kemsa, Aror, Kimorer. The cases are ongoing. It will take more than, it's now, uh, two years for KEMSA, oh no, no, sorry, one year, around close to one year for KEMSA, Aror Kimarem, Aror Kimarer, close to five years, and nothing has been done. We haven't recovered the money. Um, so about uh, expenditure and austerity measures, I, I think uh, the CS for Treasury didn't get it right. Yes. Because okay, okay. our expenditure is always very, very high. So it needs to be reduced. So austerity measures needs uh, to be put in place so that to ensure that we have less money lost. Because with more expenditure, it means that people have access to steal those monies. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. And as you said, our expenditure is very, very high. And as it stands now, we are 3.6 trillion, out of which 2.04 is going is going to be funded from our revenue. In that revenue, the only the ordinary revenue is 1.78. That leaves a deficit of almost one trillion Kenya shillings in the budget. And that broken down literally means that for every 100 shillings collected in the consolidated fund, 66 shillings is going to debt service. Mr. Brand, should this bother us as Kenyans? 
that out of every hundred shillings we are paying as taxes, sixty-six is going to pay debt. Maybe Esther, you can help him with that question. Esther, and no. Hi, will there be a Q&A yes, session? And no. Yes, 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 in the next two minutes. I will give you a chance to, to ask a question to the panelist. It seems some of those people who are supposed to respond to this question that are not in a position. So I'll read some few questions. A question from the from the chat box. And if you wish to ask a question, please raise your hand. And keep in mind that uh, the budget is very comprehensive. There is a lot we cannot be able to discuss in this short timeline. Yeah, so if you wish to say something, please lift your hand. I can see your question. I can see your question there. Yeah, and there is one here I would like to read. Someone is saying, when we talk about the youth in this country, he always feels that the assumption is that the majority of the young people are in colleges or universities, which is not the case. That is interesting. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone, anyone who has a question can lift their hand. So as we wait for that, Mr. Solomon, I had a question here on taxation. So there, there has been a view that one of the opportunities that the government had and seems to be foregoing is to, to harmonize Kenya's VAT with the region of around 18% what is being taxed in this region, 18%, to ramp up tax revenue. And now is still at 16%. So the government seems to be foregoing that opportunity. Do you think this should be the case, Mr. Solomon, as a tax expert? Okay, thank you, Nationalist. Um, I think an important thing to note uh, within the context of VAT is um, from a Kenyan perspective, yes, the VAT has been maintained at 16%, but what you'll realize is that the exemptions that were previously there have significantly been reduced. Or another way to look at it, critical items that were previously, let's say, zero rated, are now exempt. And this has a double-edged effect. If I reduce the number of items that are exempt, that means I bring in more taxable goods and services within the ambit of uh, VAT. If I can give you a very good example, Okay, okay, maybe it's a good example. Tractors before were exempt from VAT. That changed in 2019, and what they said is uh, tractors are now vertical. So any tractor bought or any tractor subsequently sold will attract that VAT of 15%. If you were to go the 18%, you miss the exemptions list across East Africa needs to be harmonized uh, purposes. Otherwise, from where I sit, the policy direction taken by the government is to instead reduce the number of services or goods that are, were previously exempt or zero rated into the taxable bracket. Um, maybe I could extend this discussion. Yeah. And, and um, yes, yes, nationalist. Okay, you can, you can say what you wanted to say. I could extend this uh, discussion further and say one of the things that the cabinet secretary for national treasury mentioned is that they wanted to come up with a national tax policy. 
And hopefully the objective of this is to increase certainty of tax. And certainty of tax is such a critical component to the day, uh, to day running of affairs for an investor. What you note, that is, uh, what you note is that uh, over the years, the tax law has been changing at a very fast rate. And this creates a lot of uncertainty. So as an investor, I'm unable to project the, num the nature of profits or the nature of activities I'm able to carry out in the next five years. And hopefully, once this national tax policy comes to being, uh, it will hopefully create more certainty and therefore make it more easy or easier for investors and people like you to me or me, you or me to you or me to plan for my tax affairs in the longer term. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that educative and informative opinion. Mr. Jim Jonyo, I see you have a question. You've raised your hand. Please, you may go on. Thank you so much, Mr. Nationalist Mbugwa. I have a question. My question uh, goes to Mr. Solomon. Uh, and my question will be in a form of a statement, so hope you'll be keen enough to, to get the key point. Uh -huh. uh, considering the... Uh, the statement, uh, the, the BPS, that is the budget policy statement, uh, as at February 2021, uh, the country projected that uh, it seems like the country will be running a consistent uh, annual budget allocation. That is an improvement uh, from now we are, uh, from today we are at 3 trillion, then uh, next year it will be 3.1, then the following year it will be 3.2. Uh, so the question is, uh, considering the uh, the tax policies that have been put in place, uh, are we are we going to to see the government reversing the tax policies uh, come next year? Maybe after the uh, maybe after the containment of the coronavirus. Uh, and if so, is true? How is the government going to maintain uh, the consistency in the in the budget? Uh, in the annual budget uh, uh, projection that has been projected uh, to be 3.1 trillion next year. Uh, having in place uh, the harsh and aggressive policies that have been mentioned uh, in the budget policy statement, can the government actually maintain the consistency uh, with the reversal of the tax, uh, uh, the tax policies that are actually uh, in place? And then another issue, I want to respond to, to Bruce Ney. Please, on the... oh, please, please, please ask one okay. question because we are okay, fine. running out of time. Okay, fine, fine. Okay. So Solomon, you may respond to him. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that question. Um, do I see the government reversing its policy towards tax? Uh, number one, you need to appreciate that the budget is quite ambitious. And when you talk about the at least three trillion, you are just talking about this from an expenditure perspective. What we need to be very keen about is that um, out of these three trillion, I'm only raising two trillion out of revenue, and the rest uh, taxes, appropriations in, rent, uh, in aid, and grants. The difference is being raised from uh, debt financing. And this is both external and domestic. Over the last few years, uh, KRA has been missing its target. And what this therefore means is that it creates pressure to borrow more in order to meet that deficit. So from my perspective, um, in my view, uh, the government will become more aggressive in trying to look for ways of uh, increasing its tax revenue the aim of reducing that deficit because one of the things i noted is uh, one of the plans that the government has is to reduce the debt ratio to around 3.4 percent of gdp what i've also noted from the last two or three finance bills subsequently passed into acts is that uh, government is increasingly running out of um, ways to increase tax revenues and if i could talk a bit about the finance bill 2020 um what you'll notice is that there are very, very few instances where tax rates have either been increased or slashed. 
However, what is key to note is that um, they've enhanced administrative measures aimed at um, increasing tax revenues. So this can be looked at in two ways. Number one, there are quite a number of companies outside of Kenya that are operating in Kenya. I know all of us are great consumers of content from Netflix, we buy things from the internet. So an immediate package was put in place had to do with what we call digital services tax that is levied at 1.5%. I would expect this to continue. Important, more importantly is that um, what KRA is seeking to do with the, or what government is seeking to do with the aim of increasing its tax revenues is number one, deploying technology through the use of data and analytics uh, to carry out audits on, its, uh, on the existing taxpayers. So this is one of the ways they think they are going to increase revenues. Number two, um, <clears throat> there is, um, how do I put this? There are these mechanisms through which tax disputes are uh, resolved, and two of these are the Tax Appeals Tribunal and um, the Alternative Dispute Resolution. So currently, I think there's at least 30 billion of cases sitting in those two jurisdictions. And what government is trying to do is to try to fast track the resolution of those cases so that those funds are unlocked and paid to care to finance the various projects. The third one is uh, currently in Kenya, when KRA comes and does an audit on a company, they are limited to five years. And what the finance bill is proposing is to increase that period from five years to seven years. So what that means is that there will be increased scope for reviews of taxes. And this is done with the hope of identifying more taxes that are not paid and therefore remitted to KRA. So Jim, in summary, I expect this aggressiveness to go on. But my personal view is that um, over the long term, uh, the government might possibly need to look at innovative ways of, number one, increasing the tax base, and as a consequence of that, uh, increasing tax revenues. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that informative opinion. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we are very much running out of time. This debate was supposed to end at 9 p.m., which is three minutes from now. I wish to take this chance to thank all of you for making it to attend. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Mr. Solomon and Busenein and all other people who have taken part in the panel, answering our questions, thank you very much. And as you can all see, there is so many areas we've not touched on. We've not gotten a, a chance to talk about the debt, things like the cost of living, the inflation and all that. And with that, I believe there is so much that we can talk concerning the budget. So we are going to have other sessions at the Economic Scholar Panel, which we will invite you. And some of you will, may take part as panelists. So check out and be on the lookout. We'll continue discussing this matter because it is very comprehensive. Thank you very much. With that, I wish to end the meeting. You may leave. God bless you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>